Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. This episode is brought to you by Millipore Sigma, a biotech company that provides infinite solutions to solve the toughest problems in life science in collaboration with the global scientific community. Their tools, services, and digital platforms empower scientists and engineers at every stage, helping deliver breakthrough therapies more quickly. Visit Sigma Aldrich to learn more about Millipore Sigma's lipidomics portfolio offerings. As neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease wreak havoc on the brain and on our aging society, scientists race to identify factors that trigger neuronal demise and figure out how to stop them. Because neurons can't be replaced, it is important to detect signs of stress in the brain early, before brain cells pass the point of no return. Scientists recently combined lipidomics with genetics and discovered that lipids are an underestimated player in neurodegeneration. In this episode, narrated by Nikki Spawich, Nila Halteman from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Melissa Voss, a neuroscientist at the Institute of Neurogenetics at the University of Lübeck, to learn more. Parkinson's disease is a devastating neurodegenerative disorder that affects roughly 10 million people around the world. The disease impairs motor control, and patients typically present with a characteristic tremor. These tremors and a subsequent progressive decline in motor function are due to the loss of dopaminergic neurons in the brain. Scientists have not found what causes this devastating disease for the majority of patients. But about 10% of patients have a heritable form of Parkinson's that is caused by genetic mutation. For researchers, linking gene mutations to a disease is like finding a treasure chest because the discovery opens up different exploratory paths that researchers can follow to study what goes wrong within the body. One path is to model the disease in organisms that have an evolutionarily conserved copy, or a homolog, of the gene that is mutated in patients. For Parkinson's disease, Studies in fruit flies have provided many insights into the pathogenic mechanisms that underlie the disorder. The fly is an excellent model to study neurodegeneration or Parkinson's disease more specifically because it's an animal model that has such a short lifespan but is having so many of the symptoms that we also observe in humans. So actually you really can mimic the disease mechanisms in the fly. Of course, because it's a fly, we would have to validate any kind of findings in a mammalian model or in a patient-derived fibroblasts. But the basic and the biochemical assays that we can do in the fly are so diverse that there is no point in going for everything for for patient-derived cells because they are limited in amount and in availability. Scientists have generated and studied several fly models of Parkinson's disease where each fly strain lacks a different Parkinson-related gene. One gene in particular, HINC1, provided mechanistic insights into Parkinson's disease pathogenesis. PINK1 encodes a kinase enzyme, and mutations in PINK1 cause a severe form of Parkinson's disease, with patients experiencing symptoms as teenagers. Researchers have studied PINK1 and its function for almost two decades, and have found that the kinase supports the cell's energy production in two different ways. First, PINK1 phosphorylates mitochondrial respiratory chain proteins, which causes them to produce ATP more efficiently. Second, the protein also polices mitochondrial function. The enzyme identifies mitochondria that don't generate sufficient ATP and marks them for degradation through a process called mitophagy. Because energy production is such an essential function for survival, PINK1 is evolutionarily conserved across many species, including worms, flies, and mammals. Over the years, scientists have generated excellent model organisms to study the mechanism of PINK1 related Parkinson's disease, including PINK1 mutant flies. The PINK1 mutant flies, they have defects in flying ability. So we can test how good they are flying compared to control or wild type fly. The PINK1 mutant flies, they have locomotion defects, and so only around 10% of these flies is capable of flying. They also have defects in sleeping, which is also one of the symptoms for patients suffering from Parkinson's disease. And this we can also test very nicely in the lab with day and night cycle, where we can really register how active a fly is during the night 
and the more active, the less sleep, of course, the fly has. So we can really test these symptoms. But of course, we can also look more into the cellular defects. And for that, we can check for mitochondrial function. We can also do immunofluorescence by dissecting a larvae and then testing for cellular markers to see if there are differences compared to wild type flies. So we have a, a huge plethora of possibilities for testing any kind of phenotypes in the fly. And so far, up until now, we really were able to confirm what we see in the fly in uh, human patients. Once scientists discovered pink one's role in mitochondria in flies, they wondered whether mitochondrial dysfunction could be a common factor that connects other forms of Parkinson's disease. Researchers discovered that model organisms for other forms of Parkinson's similarly showed reduced energy levels or other mitochondrial phenotypes. In addition, researchers found that certain Parkinson-causing toxins, like the pesticide DDT, work by interfering with mitochondrial energy production. They next searched for a mitochondrial link with other sporadic forms of Parkinson's and analyzed the characteristic Lewy bodies, intracellular vesicles that mark diseased dopaminergic neurons in the brains of Parkinson's patients. While scientists don't know what forms these vesicles or how they cause disease, they contain aggregated proteins such as synuclein. Confirming the mitochondrial hypothesis, a closer look at these Lewy bodies recently showed the presence of damaged mitochondria and, unexpectedly, a high concentration of lipids. Because mitochondria can process lipids to generate energy through a process called beta-oxidation, the presence of damaged mitochondria and lipids in Lewy bodies further strengthened the connection between Parkinson's disease and mitochondrial dysfunction and push scientists to take a closer look at these molecules. Lipids are extremely important in the brain. Without the proper lipid homeostasis, actually, you don't have a functioning brain. It's important to have a good transition of the signals from the brain to the different tissues, but also to protect the brain from toxins that are trying to enter the brain. And so lipids are really key for normal and good brain function. And if you have defective lipids, of course, you can have several neurological diseases and also neurodegenerative diseases or Parkinson's disease. So we had performed a lipidomics analysis to identify differences in lipid species in pink or mutant flies. And we have actually found that these flies have increased ceramide levels. Ceramide is one of the three most important lipids in the brain. On top of identifying the increased amount of ceramide, we also found that it is redistributed so that the distribution in the cell is altered. We have access to fibroblasts that are derived from a family that is suffering from pink one related Parkinson's disease. We then did immunofluorescence on them to test how ceramide is distributed in these cells and if we could confirm what we saw in the flies. And indeed, we did see that also in these fibroblasts that are derived from patients, there is also an effect on the redistribution of ceramides. This was really the starting point for our investigation to then try to link or to find a mechanism why ceramide is increased in amount, but also is relocalized in the cell to different cell compartments. Voss and her team wondered whether ceramide changes are a harmless byproduct of a dying cell or whether this lipid causes any of the Parkinson-related phenotypes. To answer this question, the scientists use both genetic and pharmacological tools to reduce pink one mutant animal's ability to generate ceramide and tested whether normalizing ceramide levels in pink one mutants could rescue any of the Parkinson-related phenotypes. We were able to see that if we are blocking ceramide production, we actually have an improvement of the energy production, both in the flies and in patient-derived fibroblasts. So we found this redistribution of ceramide is adding on to the phenotypes of the pink one mutant flies and in the patient-derived fibroblasts. And if we are lowering the ceramide levels using drugs, we can actually restore the phenotypes. These findings showed Voss and her team that they were on the right track and that ceramide indeed mediates or even aggravates some of the phenotypes related to the loss of pink one. The more difficult question was why this lipid causes neuronal toxicity. Ceramides form the backbone of sphingolipids, complex lipid molecules that form cell membranes. 
Recent studies show that ceramide can function in parallel to the pink one kinase to mark dysfunctional mitochondria for degradation by mitophagy. Voss and her team hypothesize that pink one mutants, who have dysfunctional mitochondria that they cannot clear, use ceramide as a coping mechanism to still mark faulty mitochondria. This initially helps pink one mutants survive. However, at some point, the amount of faulty mitochondria exceeds ceramide's ability to clear them, and the resulting ceramide overload becomes toxic to the cell. If this hypothesis is true, elevating ceramide beyond physiological levels in healthy flies should induce some mitochondrial phenotypes reminiscent of defective mitophagy and Parkinson's disease. We wanted to test if increasing the ceramide levels on its own also has already negative effect. So if you look at the locomotion, we do see that there is a reduction in capacity of flying for these flies. For the energy production, ceramide accumulation or increased ceramide doesn't seem to have a negative effect. But if you look at the morphology of the mitochondria, which is important for mitophagy or, or autophagy, we do see an effect again. Voss and her team performed several independent experiments to confirm that pink one mutants use ceramide-inducing mitophagy to survive. What remained unclear was why reducing ceramide in these mutant animals rescued Parkinson-related phenotypes, including defective energy production. If pink one mutants upregulate ceramide to overcome a block in dysfunctional mitochondria clearance, why do these flies become healthier when you disable the survival mechanism? To answer this question, the scientists scour the literature for clues that ceramide may have a separate function that is unrelated to clearing dysfunctional mitochondria, but still aggravates pink one mutant phenotypes. We had found in studies that ceramide accumulation is negatively correlated with beta-oxidation. Beta-oxidation is also a way to provide energy to the cell, but a less efficient than the electron transport chain. And so we found that in our pink one mutant flies, there is a reduced beta-oxidation levels because pink one mutants are affecting already the energy production. Any other form or source of energy is really important. So if you're on top of that, reducing other sources of energy, you're of course worsening or declining your energy even more. And so we were a bit surprised with that. And interestingly enough, if we are reducing the ceramide levels, we have an increased beta oxidation level showing a direct link between ceramide levels and beta-oxidation. The researchers found that pink one mutant cells are faced with a decision to either reduce ceramide to boost energy production through beta-oxidation, or to elevate ceramide to degrade the dysfunctional mitochondria in hopes that other mitochondria in the cell will function properly. Invariably, the mutant cells select the latter option. However, because all pink one mutant mitochondria are dysfunctional, the cell over time runs out of energy and can't keep up with mitophagy, causing a pileup of defective mitochondria and lipids similar to the ones found in Lewy bodies in the brains of patients with Parkinson's disease. Next, Voss tested whether the ceramide-related coping mechanism they identified in pink one mutants also extends to other genetic forms of Parkinson's disease by analyzing Parkin mutant flies. Mutations in Parkin cause an early onset form of Parkinson's disease that is similar to pink one mutations. And Parkin mutant flies also have mitochondrial and locomotor phenotypes. To test ceramide's role in Parkin-related phenotypes, Voss repeated key pink one experiments in Parkin mutant flies and saw similar beneficial effects on locomotion and energy production when they normalized ceramide levels in these flies. So we believe that what we found is not just important for the pink one and Parkinson-related Parkinson's disease forms, but also for other forms of Parkinson's disease. Studies have actually already showed that there is increased ceramide in other models of Parkinson's disease, including models of synuclein and also VPS35, which is a protein that is also causing Parkinson's disease. So in this way, Ceramide really seems to be a key factor that is linking all these different forms of Parkinson's disease. Because it looks like patients with different forms of Parkinson's disease all show changes in ceramide levels, scientists are now turning their attention to using ceramide as a biomarker to detect the disorder. To do so, researchers optimized lipidomic-based methods to screen for lipid alterations in patient samples. In addition, 
scientists are searching for early clinical signs that suggest the presence of Parkinson's disease before the majority of dopaminergic neurons are lost. It's really interesting because in Parkinson's disease patients, you would only start seeing symptoms when almost 70% of the dopaminergic neurons are lost. So that means that almost everything disappears and only then you start to get really clear, defined symptoms. But maybe the symptoms are already much faster appearing in life. We are just not aware that they are symptoms for Parkinson's disease. One example is that sleep defects are initiating 10 to 20 years before any other symptoms of Parkinson's disease appear. So it seems that a body can overcome a lot of stress due to a lower energy production, but certain brain regions might already be affected faster than others. And then you start seeing small phenotypes or signs that you don't immediately link to Parkinson's disease, like the sleep defects. At the moment, only studies have shown increased ceramide levels from the moment where the symptoms were already there. On the other hand, our studies actually would suggest from very early stages on, you would have increased ceramide levels because it tries to overcome other defects. If that hypothesis is true, you would indeed expect that you can already identify increased ceramide levels. But of course, this has not been investigated, so this is something that would be really interesting to test. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Nikki Spaj. And thank you to Milipur Sigma for sponsoring this episode. Please join us for our next episode as we learn how scientists study neurological disorders in a petri dish to predict and overcome drug resistance. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.